waiting for the signal that we're live. Okay. Once we have the signal that we're live, we will begin. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? Good. Good. It's so nice to have a full park board again. <laughs> How long did you guys have empty seats? Okay. Too Let's long, Kara. Too long. long. <laughs> All right, everybody. I am going to call to order the Spokane Park Board meeting of Thursday, November 12, 2020. And we have a full park board. And Pamela wanted to do a verbal roll call. So we'll let her do that. President Jennifer Ogden. Present. Vice President Bob Anderson. Present. Garrett Jones. Here. Nick Sumner. Here. Rick Chase is expected to arrive late. Greta Gilman. Yeah, he may be late. Uh, Greta's here. Greta's Sally here. Lodato. I'm here. Jerry Sperling. Present. Barbette Ritchie. Here. Hannah Kitts. Here. Kevin Brownlee. Here. Councilmember Lori Kinnear. Here. Here. Thank you, everybody. And I want to introduce Park Board members Hannah Kitts and Kevin Brownlee to you. They are our new members. And I would like to invite them to give a little uh, short sentence or two about themselves. Hannah, let's have you go first. Thank you. My name is Hannah Kitt, and I am from Colorado originally. I moved to Spokane in 2016 for school, and I graduated in 2019 from Gonzaga's Law School. Right now, I am an attorney at Lukens and Annis, and I do transactional law. I'm really excited about working on the park board because it uh, has a a lot of things about it that are compatible with what I do. I work in a lot of like land use and real estate transactions. Um, so it'll be interesting to see the administrative side of how everything works. And I also just wanted to get involved because I love the city. And Kevin. Hi, I am from Seattle originally. So University of Washington for English and Seattle University in psychology. I worked for the city there for a number of years, moved to Spokane in 1999. I worked for the city here for a number of years, working with neighborhood groups. A lot of that work involved the park board and the park department. And I really enjoyed that work, and I think it's really important. So I'm looking forward to continuing that. You can tell we've got two excellent people on the park board with excellent backgrounds and lots to contribute. So we're really glad you're here. So any additions or deletions to the agenda? All right, hearing none, we'll move on to public comment, and I'll just go down my list, and let's see, let's start with Tyler. All right, let me, <laughs> there's a huge echo in the delay on the system. I did submit a, um, a sheet of paper, I hope I made it to the meeting in terms of my um, support of the uh, amendment, which is going to be coming up. I um, wholeheartedly support that amendment, and I've been an integral part of trying to help clean up our neighbor's park. And so I think uh, my thoughts and feelings and uh, expertise in terms of this matter were outlined in that in that uh, document, and I hope everybody's had a chance to read. Yes, indeed. It was well articulated, Tyler. Thank you very much. And. Um, he is talking, of course, about the amendment to park rules and regulations and what those are, are really clarifications. Um, okay, let's see. Mary Hartsey. Okay, thank you. And good afternoon. I am Mary Hartsey, and I am here to speak about the water tower in Hamblin Park, the proposed tower. Um, I have lived one block, my family and I, from Hamblin for the past 24 years. And I realize the water tower is not on the agenda today, but its proposed location in Hamlin does pose serious questions, which I feel deserve attention. Um, by now, you've read and heard many 
of the amazing personal stories about the importance of Hamblin Park shared by neighbors who walk to this park and have their bodies, their minds, their souls nourished by its native environment. And I'd like to comment that if anything, this pandemic has accentuated the importance of city parks like Hamblin and to contemplate that on top of all uh, that we must endure with the pandemic uh, that our this neighborhood park and sanctuary is now threatened by the encroachment of a disruptive and destructive construction of a 100-foot concrete tower, which will be capped with blinking lights and a cell phone antenna is very um, painful to contemplate. And I call your attention to the posted survey results uh, that engineering services did, and I know they'll be speak to those at a later meeting, but those clearly show that the majority of the Hamden Park neighborhood residents who use the park oppose the construction of this tower in the park. Today I'm asking you, the park board members, uh, welcome to the new members and of course the experienced members, to please revisit the city charter. Specifically, I'm looking at Article 5, Section 48, and it reads that neither the park board nor the city council shall have the power to sell or exchange any existing park or portion thereof without the prior approval of the electorate given by a majority vote at the next ensuing general municipal election or special municipal election as the case may be. I feel that if you give permission to exchange a portion of Hamblin Park for the construction of this water tower without a vote of the general electorate, then what's to stop the city from saving costs by reducing the footprint of any park if the city needs to construct, for example, a much needed fire station or a maintenance shop for city vehicles? I can only imagine the hue and cry if this proposal was for a water tower in a Manitou or Comstock park. In fact, at one point, a former fire chief attempted to locate a fire station in Manitou Park and it was quickly shot down. Uh, does the Hamblin Park deserve less consideration? Does the mandate, the spirit of the city charter get tossed aside when it comes to Hamlet Park? And I do realize a water tower exists in Shadle Park. That's a 40 acre park that is developed. That tower was built in 1965 and I have not yet researched what the city charter said in 1965, that's over 55 years ago. But what happened then does not make it right today. So again, I'm urging you to please exercise your independent authority and protect Hamblin Park, so vital to the mental and physical well-being of hundreds of Spokane citizens. Follow the city charter and do not exchange any portion of Hamblin Park for a two million gallon concrete water tower. I thank you for your time and your consideration of my comments. Thank you, Mary. All right, Karen. And then we'll have Peter since you all are on the same call. Oop. Karen Sabanakis and then Peter. There you are. I hope I got the last name correct. changes in our neighborhood park this summer after unregulated food distribution began on a daily large volume basis. Illegal overnight camping in our park rose immediately. Drug dealers and bike shop shops followed.
In particular, it was helpful to have our parks identified by SPD and hotspot for increased enforcement to keep High Bridge Park gates closed and to chain the entry of the Coeur d'Alene Park gazebo. All of these were helpful. Our neighborhood has included sheltered people since I moved here, but their numbers were small and the park could be enjoyed by all. This summer's large-scale feeding programs, well-intentioned but poorly conceived, attracted an ever-growing crowd of more aggressive and more challenged individuals to Coeur d'Alene Park each night. We heard from a city official that an estimated 25 to 50% of the city's entire homeless population was sheltering in our small neighborhood. Cops provided a resource info sheet for us to share, but although I offered it often, I didn't find anyone willing to use a shelter bed, even when no barrier beds were available. Since moving here, I've been a volunteer nurse at the House of Charity Clinic, a, a NICU nanny to cuddle withdrawal babies. I've helped at the point in time homeless census. I've been a COPS volunteer, and currently I'm a trained advocate for the crisis response hotline. I sought all these service opportunities so I could personally learn more about the complex social challenges facing our community and how we could turn things around with compassion. We have a long way to go. This ordinance won't solve homelessness, but it will help greatly to ensure that people who need food assistance can receive it in a dignified and safe way. So I ask you again to please support this important amendment and thank you, Lori Kinnear, for bringing it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for your service to our community in all of those different ways. Peter. Do you mean Peyton, perhaps? Yes, I'm sorry. I wrote it down wrong. You're good. Hi, my name is Peyton Smith. I moved to Brown's Edition. Uh, I decided to retire in Spokane primarily because it's so um, beautiful with the parks right nearby the city, uh, I can walk downtown and everything. This past summer, I volunteered to coordinate a special program with the Browns Edition Neighborhood Council with the Southwest Cops Organization in which I was volunteering and doing the neighborhood observation programs. And we set up a program called Browns Watch where we walked around and we were cleaning up. We noticed that after COVID, um, the city was really having trouble. I mean, they had to stop doing services and trash was building up. And so we decided to pick up the trash. And, but we wanted to keep data. And as we kept data, the trash doubled from one month to the other. And what we noticed was the amount of food waste increasing. And it really paralleled the kind of food waste and everything paralleled with the kind of food that was being distributed in the park by well-intentioned people. But these, when I did the NAPS programs for cops and we talked to the homeless people, and which over the past three, two and a half years have been getting a little more aggressive in general. Most of the people who camp out know about city services and don't want to sleep there. But when we have unfettered um, food distribution at the park, it really created a situation where you had encampments of people that, um, as Karen said, attracted drug dealers, attracted uh, illegal activities that spread out into the neighborhood. But what I, what I want to say to the park board is, as I, I support this amendment, and I did submit a sheet to Pamela Clark, the park department was incredible. They helped us by cleaning up the bushes, which reduced the amount of feces and amount of needles and drug paraphernalia incredibly. They cleaned up and they helped us when we had way too much trash to take care of by letting us pile bags of trash there and they picked up and moved it in the morning. They came out and saw how the neighborhood was being um, overwhelmed by the population. And I also want to say that they worked with the police department and they worked with the neighborhood council. And in one summer, they responded immediately to needs that the neighborhood saw and they were incredible. I am so glad I moved here with the park department like that. I would also like to say that when Highbridge Park was closed off, the amount of homeless encampments down there 
trashed. It was incredible. The amount of trash down there is reduced. The amount of people that are using the golf course down there, the Frisbee golf course, is just blossoming. It's really incredible, and I think that also helps. And finally, I, I don't have a problem with homeless. I have a problem with homeless that do not want to seek city services that are criminals or need social services. My brother was in that situation. I helped him for 25 years. He overdosed after that period of time. But when he was on the street and people were just giving him food where he was, that's when he really spiraled down the most. We need to feed our homeless people in areas where they can get social service help. And there's some places they can wash their hands. And there's some places they can sit down with dignity. And I just want to say thank you very much to the Park Department. And I do hope you support this uh, amendment to the ordinance it's, uh, or the rules. It's a great first step. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peyton. You and Karen are quite the couple of stewarding our public uh, spaces there. We appreciate that. OK, um, let's see. Diane, original. Hello, thank you. Um, this is Diane Bergsnell. Um, I just want to make a quick comment, especially because I knew there were two park board mem new park board members at today's meeting. I know the water tower in Hamblin Park is not on your agenda for today, but it will be um, in the December meeting. So I would like to be sure that all the park board members um, take the time to get up to speed on that and reiterate what was said before. This is really a trade of parkland in um, presentations of the public, Dan Buller explicitly said utilities would fence the area off if uh, vandalism became a problem. So they clearly do not see that land as parkland anymore once they build the tower. Um, <clears throat> and no park land can be transferred. It doesn't say transferred to another City department, this is no transfer whatsoever, exchange, no exchange, no sale without a public vote. Um, and so I strongly encourage, <clears throat> excuse me, all the park board members to familiarize themselves with the provisions of the charter and the bylaws of the park board in preparation for that uh, December 12th meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. All right, Rick Biggerstaff. Hi there, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Rick Biggerstaff. And I'm the chair of the Neighborhood Council in Brown Division. And also I want to speak in support of the amendment that Council Member Kinnear has brought to you. And I want to just kind of add along with what Tyler, Karen, and Peyton have spoken about, and maybe a little bit from the Neighborhood Council's perspective when it comes to this. Two major points I think I'd like to make is to, to remind you about the comprehensive plan for Coraline Park that you approved five years ago. The plan never intended to have us see what we're seeing happening in this park or how this park is being used. The comprehensive plan was, was designed for the same reason the comprehensive plan was designed for the park, and that's what we find. We've done some things, we have some things in place that help with the issues that we're seeing. But the lack of that plan moving forward is really unfortunate. Because if we can see that plan move forward, I think we could address some of the issues that we're seeing. So that's one point I want to make, is that we do have a comprehensive plan that you approve, and the city council has approved. And we'd like to see some action on that, that comprehensive plan. The second thing I'd like to make a point about is, as a neighborhood, we are a pretty coordinated neighborhood. We work hard to be proactive rather than reactive. Our homeless population is part of who we are. We value that population. We are a diverse neighborhood our homeless population adds that diversity. We have for a number of years, and Kevin Brownlee was, was with us working with us when he was at the city. We have worked for a number of years to support local organizations in our neighborhood to provide services to the homeless population. Um, we've allocated an enormous amount of CDBD dollars to help these programs to provide these services. We've worked with them, we've been coordinated with them, and we felt like we were doing some things that were helping. What's happened recently is outside organizations come to our neighborhood and start acting within our neighborhood, unaware, and we're completely unaware of it. And they've really added a variable to our work that is out of control. 
we cannot, we cannot manage it. The city cannot manage it. Kate and Karen and Tyler have spoken about what we're seeing. Um, and as a neighborhood, our reaction to that was not to go try to have someone solve our problems. We got together as a neighborhood and decided we needed to take some type of action steps toward making this better. So we provided that volunteer group around watch that Karen and Kate have spoken about. We worked directly with the city, the police, as a neighborhood council. We brought them on board what we were doing. We did not ask them to solve anything. We just said we want you to know what we're seeing and what we're trying to do. And we reached out to these organizations from outside our neighborhood and tried to work with them. And Garrett, you were Garrett was in one of those meetings. We tried hard to coordinate with them because what was happening was completely uncoordinated and it was causing some serious issues in the neighborhood. So we brought them together and tried to work with them to make the situation better. With our sincere effort to solve this problem with, with ourselves. Um, I, we kept Councilwoman Kinnear involved in this. She knew what we were doing, as many people as we could, so it wasn't a surprise to people. In a number of hours of phone calls that I personally had with some of the outside organizations, I repeatedly, repeatedly asked them to work with us to improve the situation. I proposed solutions that might make things better. I proposed, I tried to play liaison to help them communicate with other organizations in our neighborhood. It, it did not work. Um, in my last phone call, the two hour phone call, asking again, will you work with us? And the answer was no, we're not going to work with you. We're going to do what we do and you better get used to it. I ended that phone call and called Lori. And Lori will probably remember that phone call and I said, Councilwoman Kinnear, we're done. We've done what we can do. We need help now. And this is where we're at. But I, the, the council completely supports Councilwoman Kinnear amendments. We don't think it's the solution. We think it's a needed first step, and we think it's a valuable first step. Um, it's, it falls on the shoulders of what the neighborhood has done and has wanted to do to make this better. So we would appreciate your support in this effort and know that we've done what we can do, and we need your help in this start on. And we've, we appreciate that so much. And thanks for letting me speak about that. Thank you, Rick. And please thank for me the Browns Watch Volunteer Group. It's some groups like that that really do make a difference. We appreciate Absolutely. your work. Um, Carol Ellis. Yes. I want to thank the uh, Park Board members and you, Pamela, for all the time and attention and caring you give to the issues that parks face under these times of not just COVID, but increasing pressures of population and growth in Spokane. In a prior letter, I spoke about the history of Spokane Parks with regard to the con contributions of the Olmstead, of Stan Witter, and Lawrence Hamlin. And I just want to review briefly times when the Spokane Park Board stood by listening to the public. In Manitou Park, when the fire department proposed a fire station being right to the north of Sudagawa Japanese Garden, immediately the park board gave a nay, and the result is the fire department built elsewhere. In the 80s, when a developer proposed trading Murphy Park for another park at 22nd and Havana, after the people spoke, at many park board meetings, the park board gave a nay. That was even before the charter amendment that passed in 1987 or 1988, requiring a public vote for the sale or exchange of park land. Then in Manitou, when a consultant who was paid over $100,000 proposed that Manitou be a bus shuttle only park, and the people spoke, Park board listened, and so now we have a roundabout and we have a parking area at the uh, duck pond and a parking area at various places, which is serving the public very well. So I want to remind the park board that it's not just during COVID that these parks are used, but with COVID and with people working from home and going into the future, that the Spokane Park system is a draw. It is drawing people from Seattle and Portland and California. Uh, it is drawing Spokane High School graduates who went to Seattle and Portland to return to raise their families. 
And uh, the treasure that we have here is actually more on the screen of more and more people, even around the world, who come because of the high quality of parks and recreation that we enjoy here. So I'm going to ask three requests to our park force. Number one, postpone in the spring or summer any decision regarding the Hamlin Park proposed water tower. Let the public works do their work. Two, don't accede to a tricky trick where it's not an exchange of land. Really look at the value of that park, six acres to the public that is now being served and would not have a park that was untrammeled because it's sure that the fence would go in. It's sure the graffiti would go up. And number three, just consider the wisdom of making a disastrous decision under pressure when all of our treasures in this city are more and more valued by more and more people and how much it's up to you to preserve that inheritance that we taxed ourselves for way back in 1908 and 1910 that we've been building for over 110 years. So please, please, no hasty decisions. Let public works do their work. You do your work. Protect our park system. Listen to the public. Continue to listen to the public. Make no decision in December. Let spring and suffer, summer <laughs> unroll. <laughs> and, and let more and more input come. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And if you've had any thought to form a Friends of Hamblin Park, I think you'd be an excellent president of that group. All right, Julie Pomeran. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is Julie Pomerantz. I'm on the board of Friends of the Bluff. I wasn't really expecting to speak tonight unless um, there were questions about the memorandum of understanding that's before you for uh, a vote of approval. So I'm just going to sit by and listen. Okay. And, okay. and you know, to the extent I support that MOU. Um, okay. And if you have questions, I'm here. All right, great. Thank you, Julie. All right, we have right. a David M. who is called in, and I don't know which number caller user you are, but David M. Uh, hello. I'm not even sure that I am connected, am I? Oh, I'm hearing you, so you're connected somehow. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I was calling in uh, regarding the Hamlin Park, which uh, I was told was on the agenda, but maybe is not on the agenda. Um, I just wanted to, to let my feelings be known that, you know, this is a natural park, uh, which is rare uh, in a populated area and should remain a natural park. Now, some, some people have said it's 10 acres or nine something. Some have said it's six acres. I'm not sure. But either way, taking acreage away, putting up a tower, it will no longer be a park. It won't be able to be restored. It, it, you know, once it's gone, it is gone. So uh, I think we, we need to look at it again. We need to leave it alone. You know, there's other properties that are commercial properties where, you know, you've got Shopco over there on, on Regal that is getting dilapidated and, you know, a water tower could be over there. You've got Albertsons over on Grand, the old Albertsons that's closed up. There are other places to put this rather than in a public park. And as beautiful as Manitou Park is, it is a uh, man-made park, basically. It is, you know, it's manicured, it's sodded, it's seeded, it's watered. Uh, if you put a, a tower in Manitou, which I'm not saying to do, but if you put a tower there, you didn't like it, you tore it down, you could come in and resod it and start mowing again because that's a man-made park. This is a natural park, very rare in our area, and I just think it should remain. Um, that's, that's about all I have to say at this point regarding Thank that. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Now I have Thank you. down we four more call-ins, and one of them I think is our own Rick Chase. Rick, can you identify or just speak up for a minute and I can tell which one you are? Yep, I'm here, I'm on the line right now. Okay, you're number 12. Okay, great. So we have a call in user 8, 9, and 11, which have not spoken yet. Three more people. Do any of you three want to say anything? Uh, 
Call in user eight, nine. I realize you can't see your numbers, but we have three more. Eleven. Maybe you're just here to listen. And that's okay. All right. So we will move on. I want to thank everybody who called in and spoke. You all are very articulate, and uh, we heard your words. So thank you very much. So we'll move on to the consent agenda. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yep. Uh, the uh, consent agenda, Park Board members, is in front of you. Um, do you have anybody wished anything to be removed from the consent agenda? Hearing no action on that, I will move that the consent agenda be adopted as presented. I'll second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Right. We will move on to special guests. We have Jerry Unruh from the Spokane Youth and Senior Centers Association. It's their quarterly update. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Jerry Unruh. I'm the director at Hilliard Senior Center. And uh, um, I am here, and I want to thank you for giving me a few minutes. You can see it's a very packed agenda today. So um, anyway, would like to uh, run you through... Um, our quarterly report, hopefully I can get it going here, here we go. Um, for the Cisco organization, which is the Spokane Youth and Senior Center Association, we consist of uh, 10 different youth and senior um, programs that are out here in the Spokane area and partners with the uh, Spokane Parks and Recreation. We're happy to be your partner and uh, enjoy the partnership that we've had for years and years. Uh, with 10 different agencies reporting, um, even though it was a COVID year, we've uh, basically come in at over 336,000 participant hours in both our youth and senior uh, programming um, for or actually through the third quarter of 2020. Um, in addition, we've done a few fundraisers um, at these centers. However, most of our fundraising efforts have had to be very, very creative, uh, virtual, um, minimal in size in comparison to uh, years that are non-COVID pandemic years. Um, our youth programs, they have been um, probably operating more closer to normal than any of the senior programs, which are very uh, limited due to the governor's stay-at-home order. Um, our next slide is, is simply our attendance numbers that uh, equate to that 300 and I think it's 337,000. Uh, participant hours uh, as of the third quarter. Some of uh, the highlights from our youth programs, uh, which, as I mentioned, have been the, the programs that have been able to operate in more of a normal fashion. Our Northeast Youth Center have been quite busy. They've uh, been out bowling with the kids, roller skating. Um, they've ventured out in summertime to some of the local parks, uh, hiking and doing games. Um, they've been able to hook up at uh, the water at Harmon Park, and uh, even though that wasn't quite the same as going to the swimming pools, which they really did miss uh, this year, they spent a lot of time at the pools in the summertime. Um, during the school year, it's been a little bit interesting. Um, they've had 90 kids enrolled in their program and are averaging about 65 of those kids attending on a daily basis at the Northeast Youth Center. Um, over at East Central Community Center, MLT Center, um, they again have been involved with a couple of different programs, their PALS program and their FAME program. Um, you can see some of their youth programs that participated in things like pumpkin painting. Um, they also were a distribution site for the Coach for Kids uh, program at the MLK Center as well. At West Central Community Center, uh, they were a learning center for 40 kids, uh, as well as having a before and after school program. Um, this photo that you see here, that is not dandruff in that boy's hair. That is an actual snowy day in which they went to Green Bluff and participated in their annual pumpkin search. Um, the Southwest Spokane Community Center, uh, formerly known as the Peaceful Valley Community Center, um, again, quite busy with their kids and, and different games. Uh, they had a staff graduation party. 
Um, they also, a, lot, a number of their kids visited with the uh, cops horse patrol at Coeur d'Alene Park. So they, uh, they were busy during the summer as well. And then moving into our seniors, as, as we mentioned, most of the activity that happened at our senior programs um, were really revolving around fundraising. It, it, it was really a devastating year for senior programs in a, in a sense that uh, we've been forced to close our doors for most of the year. Um, Corbin Senior Center, this was a uh, very large, uh, very large uh, yard sale, garage sale. This actually comes out of their thrift boutique, which they have. Um, and also, um, they have participated in a number of other programs during the summer. They, they combined uh, with some groups where they did an outdoor um, garage sale. But most of their stuff have been around uh, doing fundraisers at the centers. Um, Project Joy, which is a uh, senior entertainment organization, uh, they started doing some outdoor um, entertainment for facilities beginning in June, um, through the months of June, July, August, and even into September, Project Joy entertainers um, were quite busy doing um, those outside performances, as well as preparing some video performances, which are being placed on their YouTube channel. Um, those video performances are being utilized by some of these housing facilities so that they can provide entertainment for their residents as well. Um, these are some of the entertainers uh, that participated in some of those outdoor entertainments. Uh, Hilliard Senior Center, my center, we were really focused on third quarter, of, uh, third quarter doing virtual programming uh, on our website. Uh, we also heavy into our senior pledge fundraising campaign, which um, has our seniors as well as all our business partners uh, participate in helping us raise funds to uh, help our operations at Hilliard Senior Center. We did hundreds of wellness check-ins with our members, also provided COVID care bags. You can see the uh, first interstate uh, bank employees on the bottom photo there. They, pro they provided the grant monies to provide those um, care bags and we distributed them to many of the seniors in need. Offsite recreation programs, small groups, mall walking, um, providing playing cards, board games, puzzles, word searches, those kind of things to our members who requested them and uh, they were able to do some of that at their home with their family members. And we also provided a summer diner's choice program, uh, which we collaborated with the Valley Meals on Wheels program, uh, providing 60 seniors with daily lunch programs um, where they had a voucher they could check in with any of the uh, local area restaurants that were participating and got a, a meal, they, all they had to do was go pick it up. And for those that couldn't drive anymore, we also provided volunteers and staff who did home delivery on those programs. Um, Sinto Senior Activity Center, they just recently had a spaghetti takeout fundraiser um, this last weekend on Friday and Saturday. They served over or, or nearly 100 people on those two days. Uh, it was a great opportunity for them to connect with their members and even though they're Visits were very short. They, uh, those members enjoyed uh, being able to stop into the center. Um, you also see that they also had garage sales going on throughout the summer outside. And when the weather got a little colder, they moved it inside into their ballroom as well. All of these to, uh, as I mentioned, fundraise to help their operations. Um, Mid City Concern Senior Program, their facility was closed for almost the whole summer. Um, and that was mainly due to, uh, I think, damage that they had to their roof. So they had a lot of construction going on. And so the, a huge thank you to uh, Southside Senior Center who provided their kitchen for Mid-City to prepare their Meals on Wheels um, and, and provide those meals to their clients. So um, they're also doing lots of check-ins, providing newsletters, as all of our centers are, um, to keep connected with our with our members as well. And then at Southside Senior Center, they, they are hosting a couple of different people. Obviously, the, um, the Meals on Wheels program from Mid-City, but also the Skyhawks Academy are in their facility as well. Um, so they're doing a couple of rentals. Um, they also held the indoor garage sale in, in their ballroom as well as a fundraiser. 
And then, of course, uh, you know, quite a few of their volunteers are involved in, and helping out around doing a lot of their, their groundwork, um, which is a lot at that facility. So we've all uh, been quite busy fundraising. Youth programs have been excited uh, about being able to provide programs, but we mainly thank you, appreciate our, our partnership with Parks and Rec, appreciate the opportunity to do uh, a quarterly report for you. Your funding is vital um, to our operations of our organization, especially now during COVID times. So I thank you for your time. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you for all the work that Cisco do, does. You all are very important partners and really sort of help us reach out into the community. So um, kind of tentacle fashion, so we really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Park Board members, you'll see under your special action item, it's the Park Board Committee assignments. Normally we rearrange committees and people uh, rearrange liaisons uh, in our February meeting, which is the annual meeting. But of course, we don't want to wait till February for Kevin and Hannah to get working. And I know that Nick in particular really needs more bodies on his committee. So um, I think that you were sent the information, thank you, Pamela, about Kevin and Hannah's choices, and they are Riverfront Park Committee and Land, and then Kevin would also like to be on Joint Arts Committee. So I would like to make a motion that those committee assignments be made to Kevin and Hannah, if that's all right with you all. I'll second. I'll second. Great. And any further discussion? All right. Okay. Whoop. Okay. Hearing none, then I will call for the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And opposed? Thank you, everybody. All right. Nick, you have more people on your committee. And Greta, you too. <laughs> Great. I'd just like to chime in, Jennifer, and say thank you. Um, I was able to be a part of the interview team and very thrilled and excited to have Kevin and Hannah joining us. All right, as are we all. Okay, Mark Buning, it's time for the financials. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, inundate you with some numbers here. Let's see if I can share my content. Okay, we're wrapping up her financial report through October, and we will start looking at looking at the Parks Fund. Our first graph here is we see we're comparing our year-to-date expenditures uh, compared to our two-year budget average, and we see that our expenditures are significantly below our budget. And this is obviously due to COVID and reduced temp seasonal hiring or reduced capital expenditures and overall cost containment across the division. Uh, 2020 expenditures are approximately $6.7 million less than at the same point in 2019. And any questions? We'll move on to look at comparing revenues. Here on the revenue side of the ledger, we see that our 2020 revenues are significantly again below the two-year budget average, but revenues are approximately $4 million less than the same year in 2019. Apparently, I mean, obviously due to not being able to conduct a lot of our revenue generating programs and events at Riverfront Park. Um, so that has definitely had an impact on that side of the ledger. Now, when it all comes to balance out, we compare our year-to-date revenues to our year-to-date expenditures. Uh, we see this comparison of the two. And in 2020, revenues exceeded expenditures by about $2.3 million. By contrast, last year, 2019, at this same point in the year, expenditures exceeded revenues by about $170,000. So, uh, through our tight expenditure control, the Parks Fund has been, been put on some more solid financial footing as we begin to move into the, the last quarter of the year and move into 2021. Any questions or comments before we move to the Gulf Fund? Okay. Looking at the moving into the Gulf Fund. Uh, here again, we're comparing our expenditures. Our year-to-date expenditures are below the two-year historical average by about 15%. 
Total expenditures in 2020 are about $220,000 less than at this same point in 2019. Uh, moving on to revenues for the Gulf Fund, then the Gulf Fund is really bucking the trend here. Um, even in this COVID year where the Gulf Fund had to have some forced closures, Gulf revenues are exceeding the two-year revenue bu budget by about 10%. Actual 2020 revenues are about a half a million dollars over revenues at that same point in 2019. And that's total revenues. And our year-to-date facility improvement fee is about $642,000. And the year-to-date reserve for that facility improvement fee is slightly over a million dollars. So the Gulf Fund is doing very well. Then here again in the Gulf Fund, when we compare our year-to-date revenues to year-to-date expenditures, uh, through October, total revenues have exceeded expenditures by about $1.6 million. This is an improvement of about $700,000 compared to October of 2019. Again, this puts the Gulf Fund in a very great, good position, good financial footing as we move into the winter off season where you know, obviously there's no revenues being taken in, but there's some fixed costs and salary and benefits and, and maintenance fees or maintenance costs and things like that, that, um, that continue throughout that slow year until the spring. Any questions on the Gulf Fund? Our last slide we will look at here is the, the, the bond fund or this, or where we are at right now. Um, as of October 31st, we've expended about $63.7 million with about $4.2 million that's committed with the remaining balance of about $590,000. So that is the state of the bond fund as we end in, move into the last quarter of 2020. Any questions or comments? That concludes the financial report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. We are coming to the end of that major bond project. And Riverfront yes, Park, I think, I think Riverfront Park is showing how great it's been. So thank you to all the citizens who voted yes for that uh, bond. All right, we're going to move into our committee reports. Now, the Urban Forestry Committee did not meet. Rick, did you want to say anything? No, I mean, we've only had like one meeting, I think, since February, so <laughs> not much going on that I know of. I know. All right, we'll move on to golf. Jerry Sperling. Yes, hi, Jennifer. Thank you. Golf is still alive and well, doing a variety of things, of course, but to start off the uh, park board meeting today, uh, we're going to have an action item, and with that, uh, we are looking at a uh, contract renewal for Doug Fair's uh, the Golf Pro at Indian Canyon. And with that, I would like Jason Conley to, uh, well, I can't ask you to come forward, Jason, but there you are. <laughs> anyway, Jason's going to walk us through uh, not just uh, what we're doing with Doug in particular, but a little bit more about how this contract actually um, um, begins and the do's and don'ts and a variety of things that we just thought would be very important for our new board members to have a bit of a review, uh, as well as an introduction. So with that, Jason. Well, welcome. thank you. Thank you, Jerry. That's a wonderful intro. Um, for those of you who are on golf committee uh, a couple of days ago, yes, you're going to hear some additional information. And, and I do apologize um, as staff, sometimes we struggle with how much information to provide to our committees where we give you enough to be informed, but not so much that I put you to sleep. And I think I, I might have come a little bit on the short end on Tuesday. I was so excited to be allowed upstairs for a meeting with my fireside background that uh, I missed the content, uh, but I'm banished back to the basement here at my house. And so with that, um, I am gonna share my screen here just to make sure that works and once we get that rolling here. Um, then I think uh, I can fill you in. Oh, that is it. Exactly the problem with you know, keep updating. Ah. Not 
hot dog. Okay. Um, here's before we get into the presentation. I think for the new members, um, and then also for for just a reminder to some um, how it works in Spokane. We have a what used to be a very common model in golf. In fact, most golf courses throughout the nation used it. Not as many, then management companies came in uh, to fruition, but now the trend's coming back our way, believe it or not. And that model is we, we are the owner of the golf courses. They're, they're park department owned and operated courses. The maintenance staff works for the city. They're city employees. Uh, many of us, like myself, Mark Poyer, all our superintendents and assistant superintendents, we, we all have our hands in golf. Jennifer Pappas, who's the director of recreation, um, has golf tucked under, under recreation. But then we contract out with our golf pros. And the golf pros run what we we'll consider the golf side of the business. So they run the elements that tend to be the touch points for the customer and the consumer. And that's everything from booking, helping us book green, green fees and starting people off every day on the golf course, running tournaments, the merchandising of the golf course, food and beverage, driving ranges, uh, ranges, teaching lessons. Those are all things that the golf pro runs. And I know I'm probably getting a, a few on, on both sides of it. But, and with that, we have a contractual relationship uh, between parties. And so I think it's important to know that we have kind of three different types of contracts. Um, we have generally every every so many years we, we need to get to where we are today, and, and I'll get back to that in a second. So prior to 2014, um, and the city had been with this model since at least the 1960s, if not before, of what I just described with, with the contractual relationship with golf pros. And Typically, a pro would compete for their job, and then contracts would, would run their course. They'd be extended a certain number of times, and then it, it was kind of decided by both parties or maybe by city legal or purchasing time for a new contract, and we drop a new contract and we'd present it to the pro, and, and both parties would sign, and it would go back on the file. Well, over time, um, the city's really decided to, to follow, and, and Council Mayor, you know this, a procurement process where about every five years we need to, that's kind of the end of a contract. And, and there are some exceptions. Um, this is one of them where we do want to compete them. We do want to follow state procurement process. And, and the park board recognized that golf was one of the areas that needed to be brought in under this umbrella or, or, or they desired to bring it in under the so between 2014 and 2015, um, when we competed this first request for proposal, what happened is uh, the golf pro at the time at Indian Canyon, his contract was set to run out the end of 2015. And that gave us plenty of time to meet as a committee, to meet as a board. And, and Nick uh, Sumner, I know he was part of this process along with the golf chair at the time who was pressed in contrast the board really provided us as staff, what are the rules to the game, if you will? What are the elements that we can include in the RFP? What are the things um, that are, are desirable? You know, what, what were our look for's? And so with that, we came up with the idea that a 10-year um, contract is what we wanted, but we didn't want to just give a blanket 10-year contract. So what, what was decided by, by the golf committee at that time was, let's do a five-year contract with an optional five-year extension. The, the board and the committee also provided some uh, desires as far as revenue share, what percentage the city would get, what percentage the pro would get. And what you're gonna see today is different from what happened prior to 2014 in the prior contract. Uh, we also wanted some consistency among our contracts and, and we had that in some elements, but not in all. Um, and, and so that was looked at hard hard and fast. Um, we wanted to look at uh, a depreciation schedule so that if improvements were made on the course, um, you know, by the city or by the golf pro, that nobody got hurt financially and one party didn't owe the other at the end of a contract period. 
And at, at the same time, there was a lot of work that was bubbling up about a strategic plan for golf. And, and you just heard from Mark Bean that we have over a million dollars in the bank in that strategic fund. Plus, we've, we've done two big projects. We've delivered a, a full Indian Canyon project and a full Esmeralda, Esmeralda Golf Course project. So all those things were happening at that time. And, and, and where we get today is um, Indian Canyon was the first, then went Esmeralda, then went Qualchin, then went Downriver. And that's just how the, the last extension or extensions of each of those contracts fell into place. So a year ago, if you were here, um, you heard us do Steve Connor. Well, Steve Connor was actually number four of the beginning of the process, which is the beginning of that five-year original contract, five-year extension slash renewal. About springtime this year, we brought before you a different contract, and that was a true up with Doug, and that was related to the financial hardship that he uh, incurred while we tore up the golf course for a fall and a spring. Now, where we're at today, this is the second piece of the full contract, and that is the extension slash renewal, which when Doug did his full uh, proposal, which if you look at the, um, the packet, you saw that I included it it's from a few years ago, but those were his ideas at the time. You notice he didn't have to present anything about how he was going to survive um, an irrigation project. Because quite honestly, at that time, we didn't know we were going to do one. We know we, we knew we needed one, but we sure didn't know how to pull it off. And and that's where we're at today. This is this is a five-year extension. So Doug did not have to recompete for this extension. This was, this is part of the original contract and where we are here is this is the check-in point this is for us as a city to say yes we're happy with how things are going and we'd like to carry it forward equally important it was an opportunity for doug to say yes this is also working for me i, I love being a partner with the city and i'd like to continue and so doug gave us a, a, a notification back in the summer saying yes i want to exercise my extension option which was provided in his original contract and where we are today is, is to jog that forward. And, and that's what I'm here to tell you about is, is the original contract started in 2016 and it is set to expire December 31, 2020. Uh, we didn't want to uh, bump this into the December uh, park board meeting, basically because if there was any uh, delay or challenge, there could be a window of time where he, he would not be under contract yet still um, like is being asked to operate the golf course and, and the elements that I had described. Um, so as I mentioned, we did the original contract in 2015, leading into Doug starting in the spring of 2016, although he was in working in January, uh, totally revamping the course. We did, we talked about the true up and, and the amendment for lost revenue that we completed in February of this year. And here we are today to talk about it. Uh, five-year extension. There's been qu quite a few accomplishments and accolades. I've talked about some, but um, five years ago, the course was in need of on and off course improvements pretty much in every element you can think of. Um, there were extensive off, off course upgrades to the print shop, to the restaurant, to the patio, there have been dynamic upgrades to the course itself and the driving range. Um, for those of you that have been around a while, you remember that at one point the driving range tended to flood every spring and, and we would jokingly say we had a lake or a pond which we didn't want because it created a big mucky mess that we couldn't use the driving range, um, which is the largest driving range uh, in the city. So it was important to get that corrected, which we have an open we have a clean bill of health in golf as a whole, but certainly it, it lies right here um, at Indian Canyon as well from the city auditors and the state auditors. And, and during this window of time, um, you know, golf had, had some uh, management letter findings from the state that we had corrected. It took all of the golf pros, it took our, our parks accounting staff and Mark Beating and our city auditor and their team uh, to get us there, but but we're there and we're real excited about that. And 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 you see the amount of money coming in and the relationship that we have. So it's important 
that our, our books are clean. Uh, Doug's done a great job about bringing back some significant golf tournaments, and, and the most predominant is the Rosars Golf Tournament. Uh, Rosars did not happen this year because of the pandemic, but there was a period of time the Rosars Tournament left Indian Canyon because they just didn't feel like it was a showcase for their marquee tournament. That's not the case anymore, and we're real excited to be their permanent home. Uh, we've also brought back the Inland Empire uh, two-person best ball tournament, which was a staple of the Spokane golf community for years and, and just went away. It was great to bring it back. But I think you know, when you get right down to the bottom here, what's exciting to all of us is the course is in great health, both uh, physically, environmentally, and now with financial stability. Um, these terms are just to kind of educate everyone on the split. This is the existing contract language, and thus we're proposing to carry it forward. Parks and revenue receives 2% of the driving range, 2% of the rental park fees that come in, 2% of merchandise, 50% of golf lessons that are sponsored by park and recreation through the recreation catalogs that you see come out four times a year although golf probably is only open about two of those times. 40% of facility rentals, if it's rented for something um, besides golf. Uh, course, a course rental, if the whole course was rented for something other than non-golf. We haven't had one of those in the last five years, but an example could be a cross-country tournament that was a fee-based tournament um, uh, competition where we wouldn't have golfers out on the course, and of course the city would want to uh, seek some revenue for that. And this 90% here is normally 100%. Normally the city would get 100% of green fee. This 90% is due to what amendment we passed back in February to, to true dug up for his financial hardship during the irrigation project. We're within $2,000 of making him whole and had we not closed for nearly six weeks this year, we would have made it. That was our intended plan. But because we haven't, I need to make sure that the new contract reflects that language just so it's not lost in the shuffle. Now, if we switch to the next slide here, this is the money that's going, um, proposed money going to the professional, both existing and in future which we're, we're looking to make 100%. So Doug would receive 98% of the driving range, rental carts, merchandise, and 50% of golf lessons, 60% of, res of receipts for facility rentals. He receives 100% of food and beverage sales. None of those sales are rung in through the city system, which is actually kind of a good thing because if you've worked in food and beverage, it's a whole new inventory model to keep track of, of all your product and 10% of green fees until payment is set. Um, with that, and I'll, I'll be quite here in a minute and ask, answer any questions. Um, it is a staff recommendation and the golf committee also recommended uh, move this forward to the full board today to approve a contract with Doug Ferris doing business as TNT Golf Management incorporated for an additional five years, January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2025, at which time it, at the end of that period, so in the 2025 year, um, we'd be working with you as a board to come up with contract terms for the next contract cycle. Because remember, Indian Canyon is first out of, out of the four courses to look at is 10 years still the right number? Are the percentages still right? That would be a really good time to begin to look at making big changes um, if there were any. So with that, Jerry, I'll toss it back to you and ask for uh, any questions that folks may have. Thank you, Jason. Um, I think Jerry's having some audio issues. We'll give her a minute to see if she can call in. Um, anybody have any questions? That was an excellent presentation. All right, let's see if Jerry's in. Jerry, are you in? Okay. Gremlins, always, every meeting. All right, so I will go ahead and make the motion then that we approve the Indian Canyon Golf Pro Doug Fair's five-year contract uh, for the period of time specified. This is Barb Ritchie. I'd second that. Okay. 
Any further discussion? All right. Hearing none, I'll go ahead and call for the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Jerry, did you want to say anything else? Are you able to? I'm not sure if I'm still on. Yes, we can, have echo. We, can, we can hear you. If I just talk quietly and slowly, uh, will that help? Yes, everybody else, please make sure you're muted. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank Jason uh, and you, Jennifer, for taking over. As soon as I complete this, I'll back out and see if I can come back. Uh, just want to let you know that um, at all the courses, we are getting ready for uh, winter activities. And at the clubhouses and pro shops, they will be open. And uh, we will be having uh, simulators, junior golf, adults, and visitors alive. Uh, we're just kidding. Uh, clean up. And that will be ongoing uh, throughout winter until the snow gets too big. Okay, great. Well, um, golf has really been the rock star uh, during COVID. It certainly has been a wonderful opportunity for many families to get out and, in fact, has doubled its revenue over last year just because there's such a demand for that. So we'll move on to Rec, Sally. Of course, they haven't been meeting. Poor Sally. But did you want to say anything, Sally? Uh, I guess okay, it helps to unmute. Sorry about that. Yes. Um, thank you. I wasn't quite ready. <laughs> um, yes, Rec meet, met. We finally got to meet. It was pretty exciting. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. And thank you. Yes, you met the fourth. I see that. Just that you had no action items. All right. No, we didn't. But we had some discussion items. And I first wanted to recognize uh, Jennifer had announced that Carissa Bragg, um was recognized as the Parks and Recreation nominee for the Employee of the Quarter. So we um, certainly wanted to share that at Park Board and congratulate Carissa for that. Uh, the recreation, we did uh, not have any action items, but we did defer our action item to the December meeting, which is the um, Recreation Center's contract renewal for $638,578. There was a slight change that uh, had to be uh, approved for um, through the city's legal. So we'll see that again next month. And then also, I don't have as much of this information. I'm sorry, and Jennifer might have to. She's smiling because she knows I'm a little preoccupied feeding the baby. <laughs> anyway, um, the there was also some really great um, information uh, with what rec recreation is doing during COVID and all the great things they did in the summer and then their uh, uh, guide for the fall using the postcard and some of the classes. And Jennifer, if I can kind of defer to you to maybe share some of the highlights, because I think there's just a lot of great information there and versus me just reading through it, I think you could probably jump right to the hot spots. And I just want to make sure we recognize Jennifer and her team for all the great stuff they've done during COVID to really make this work and bring to our community some great activities. So I'm gonna turn this over to Jennifer. <laughs> Thanks, Sally. They did a great job. Um, you know, I just, we hadn't met since February. So it was really nice to actually meet even though it was only virtually. And many of the recreation supervisors were able to attend, which was great. And we just kind of wanted to share all of our challenges and successes that we have been able to accomplish. Um, for our boredom busters online, the virtual programming, we had summer in-person camps, and then in the fall, we started offering outdoor trips and um, very low capacity programs at the Arts Center, um, Cornhole out at the White Mobile Sports Complex. And the staff has just really embraced this new normal. Um, they look at things so positively. They are so thankful to be out in programming for the community, and the community is so thankful that we are out there doing things for them. So um, kudos to the recreation staff. My team is amazing, and they have been able to do 
such creative, wonderful programming, which will continue um, on this fall and into the winter as well. So couldn't be more happy for, for all that they are doing and they are working their tails off to, to make it safe and to make it um, comfortable for people to come up and recreate. Great, thank you. The other Jennifer. Anything else, yes. Alan? I, if Greta or Bob, you both were there and I appreciate your time um, on our meeting. Do you have anything else to add? I guess all I would add is how impressed I was with how much the rec staff was able to do with their reduced funding, reduced staffing levels, and the amount of pride. It was so obvious on what they did. It, it was very impressive. and. Thanks to your entire staff, Jennifer. And I'll, I'll second that. And um, they also assured us they're going to do everything they can to get schools open this summer. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you to the whole team. Thank you, Sally. You're muted, Jennifer. There you go. All right. So I'll try that again. So thank, thank you, everybody. And uh, now you all know. I didn't mean to skip over land. I'm going to let Greta go. But now you all know where I put my cell phone on the agenda. Is land up now? Take it away. <laughs> OK. Um, first of all, welcome. Uh, Anna and Kevin to the Land Committee. I'm looking forward to having your help and input uh, with our Land Committee group. And one of you I'm going to assign to uh, be in charge of reminding me to see if items belong on the consent agenda or not. Uh, because we can do that at this Land Committee. So all our action items are on the main uh, part board agenda. And the first action item is Park Rules and Regulations, Title 12 Amendment. We heard uh, quite a bit of public testimony uh, on those earlier today at our meeting. And we have Garrett, Jones, Mary, Maramatsu, and others here. Um, do we have a presentation on that? Uh, not a formal presentation, uh, Greta. But uh, we can give a quick uh, kind of overview. And if there's any questions that we're in our packet. That sounds great. All right, perfect. perfect. Well, uh, first off, I'd like to thank all the staff, legal staff and neighborhood representatives like Rick Biggerstaff and the Browns edition, uh, and also the stakeholders. This is a very great process because we've had a lot of um, drafts of this agreement through through time and um, and it's changed over, you know, meeting with stakeholders and adding and subtracting. And so the, the three main areas that we wanted to focus on of our previous rules or rules were lack of clarity, uh, lack of coordination and, and resource management, and lack of follow through. And so through that, we wanted to include our goals of increasing communication and coordination, allow parks to see proposals and park events ahead of time, allow parks to identify any impacts or additional resources needed, uh, allow uh, parks to identify and, and communicate those impacts with the neighborhood and surrounding businesses, establish common sense cleanup guidelines, and then also increase that accountability of restoring those, those park facilities after the event. Um, so with that, you'll see those areas of, of per, broken up into areas of per, permits and reservations. Uh, drug paraphernalia is another section, food, and the cleanup and cost recovery and the exclusion pieces of uh, the amendment. With that, Mary's here to answer any of the legal questions. Is there any questions uh, for me? Hello, Mary? Yes, Greta, can you hear me? No, Garrett, I just have one comment. Can you hear me now? Great. Um, sorry for all that, folks. I hit the wrong button somewhere. Uh, anyway, I did have a lot of questions and I uh, ahead of time, was able to get them all answered by Garrett, Greta, <coughs> excuse me, Garrett and uh, Mary. And this this was just uh, you know an exercise in bringing myself up to date. Uh, for those of you who are new board members, uh, hopefully you did receive some of the ordinance C um, 
that we were asked to look through, but um, just appreciate everybody's efforts and outlining the things that I know everyone is concerned about. So thank you. All right, well, I would like to make a motion that uh, we approve the park rules and regulations, Title 12 amendments. I'll second that. I'll uh, move to second and to third. Any further discussion? All right, then I'll call for the question. Ms. Jennifer wants to speak. No, you go ahead. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the motion carries unanimously. Our next item is Church uh, Star Western Equipment Lease Agreement. Um, not to exceed $100,000 a year for the next five years to lease uh, equipment that I understand the Scott has a lot of aging equipment, needs to do some, some upgrades, and leasing is the, uh, the most cost effective way for them to uh, get the new equipment that they need. Apparently, the golf uh, division has a similar lease program. Uh, and Carl Strong is here. Did people have questions about the details of the Turf Star Western Equipment Lease? Okay, I uh, have no questions, so I would like to make a motion that we approve this Turf Star Western Equipment Lease agreement up to exceed a year on a five year lease. I'll second that. Okay, well uh, moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Uh, hearing none, I will call for the question. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. I believe the motion carried unanimously. Our uh, third land committee action item is the Friends of the Bluff. Memorandum of Understanding of Renewal. This is update and renewal of a Memorandum of Understanding that was first established in uh, 2016 with the purpose of uh, the purpose of this amendment is a language cleanup of the previous Memorandum of Understanding. Uh, inclusion of a map, exhibit, and description of the high drive plus area, and to provide operational decision-making authority to the parks director designee rather than the then park board consent, and to establish regular meetings between the front of the bluff, uh, board members, and staff. Uh, Angel Bell's here to answer questions and I also understand that Duke from Bus is was here anyway, and I think it's still here. Um, if there's any discussion or questions. All right, well, hearing none, I would like to move that we approve the uh, Friends of the Bus Mem Memorandum of Understanding Renewal. Do I have a second? Second, Barb Ritchie. Thanks, Barb. Any further discussion? Uh, hearing none, I will call for the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Uh, the fourth. Action item is land expressions LLC construction contract for the Manitou Park Japanese Garden Pond Restoration. And Nick is here to provide uh, a presentation on this uh, cool project. Sure, Greta. I uh, will give you all the information you'd like to hear. Uh, we'll hopefully sure. make sure. it as quick as possible. <laughs> make it as quickly as we can so that we can get everybody out here at a reasonable hour. Um, I think one of the important things that we'd like everyone to know um, 
is that this is a partnership with our utilities division. It is part of the Parks Water Conservation Program. Um, we've done a number of projects in this program over the last several years. We're completing up to five of them, reducing 30% consumption in each project. And we certainly wanted to hit an iconic park and a pond with this project program. And this is that project. Um, Today, we've completed three projects so far. We've got this one in contracting. Hopefully, we'll be completing that soon if it's authorized to proceed. Um, and then we're working in design on, on another project as well as uh, an in-house improvement and a splash pad. What's important is that over the course of this year, we've saved 34.2 million gallons. That's just under 5% of our total park use and we are the biggest single water user in the city of Spokane. So that's a significant amount of water. And we've actually saved quite a bit this year on top of that, just from a staffing ability standpoint. But this is a year after year that we can expect to see moving forward. One of those projects we completed in the spring was the 2020 Grand Avenue irrigation, which you can see in the purple boundary. The other in the orange boundary, the project before you today. Of course, this is all within Manitou Park. Garden was constructed in the late 60s, early 70s. It looks something like the image on your screen you see here. Um, this project will save over 85% of the amount of water we use annually within that park. That's 16 and a half million gallons, and we should be able to do it while preserving our koi. Um, that's by installing a number of automatic filling controls, replacing filled pump systems, installing water quality filtration, and then doing all of the code related work that needs to be done. A quick diagram that is important, I think, uh, valuable for the board to see is that right now, this uh, water consumption is sort of out of sight, out of mind, so we see a lot of water used because we don't really know what's going on. Uh, we pump water out of our municipal water system through a water channel uh, down into the pond, and it goes directly out of the pond and into the sewer all day, every day, all year long. This is 18 million gallons or more a year. This is over 50,000 gallons a day. To put that in perspective, my house was last month. I have an average residential lot. I used about 1,500 gallons or a little less in a month. So that's a lot of water. Um, what we're going to do is catch that water and recirculate it. It's not uh, rocket science necessarily, but it'll save us quite a bit of water, and we can do it in a way that will keep the fish healthy as long as we install the filtration that's a part of this project. So it could be a, a really big win for the garden to have a nice pond, but also uh, our operations crew will be installing some jets as a part of this work, some filtration, so that all the pine needles and leaves that fall in the pond that we normally have to wade in there and rake out can be pushed to the edges of the pond fairly automatically and scooped up with a lot less labor. So there's some labor, um, incentive for doing this work as well. We received only one bit on the project. It's pretty special, specialized work, pool, pool type and water feature type contractors. Um, Land Expressions LLC was that bidder. This is the same contractor who constructed the uh, Rotary Fountain improvements here recently as a part of the Luth Carousel project in Riverfront Park. So that's my spiel. you have any questions? All right, I'll turn it back over to you, Greta. Okay, well, I would like, like to make a motion that we uh, approve the Land Expressions LLC construction contract the Manitou Park Japanese Garden Pond Restoration uh, in the amount of $286,843.69, including tax. I'll second that. Uh, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? In that case, I will call for the question. Uh, all in favor, uh, say aye. 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 Sorry. Opposed? Uh, the motion carries unanimously. So those are our action items, and they kept us pretty busy for most of the land committee meetings. We had uh, a presentation from Al Vorderbergen on um, park operations. The Sadly, the Friends of the Manager sponsored Project to Light the Conservancy Conservatory in Manitou will not take place this year due to COVID, COVID but staff is working to come up with some type of drive through uh, Christmas life celebration. 
And Nick presented a park planning update to the Park Gorge Trail Phase 2. Water access and parking lot work will be completed in the next two weeks, and that was a week ago, so maybe uh, in the next week or so, with the rest of the trail complete in uh, 2021. And we've had some groups all to come see the new piece of art convergence by Sarah Thompson Moore, and that is uh, near People's Park. And the next land committee meeting will be uh, 2.30 p.m. on December 2nd via WebEx. That is my report. There we go, better. Thank you, Greta. I think it was a good meeting at land, and I think it was good for our new people to hear about some of what land committee does, because it hasn't been meeting all that often, so especially since they're both going to be joining that committee. All right, Riverfront Park Committee, Nick Sumner. Nick, do you need to unmute? We are not hearing you. Can anybody else hear Nick? Is it just me? Nobody's hearing Nick. No. Rats. Nick, do you want to try to call in? Or maybe your computer audio's off? Nuts. All right, well, well, Nick, why don't you try to call in? And while you're doing that, I attended that meeting and I will talk a little bit about the U.S. Pavilion Elevated Experience name proposal. Do we have a staff member who would like to introduce that with pictures? Hey, uh, Jennifer, this is Garrett. I don't have any fancy pictures that are, uh, that are not in your packet. But I can just kind of give you a brief overview of the project. Go for it. Perfect. Well, um, as you know, after the construction of our U.S. Pavilion uh, staff and working with the fire department and permitting, we looked uh, and found some alternative uh, and additional improvements that needed to be done to the uh, pavilion to be able to take us over the top, be able to give us more opportunities in the future, uh, be able to increase our capacity, uh, make it so we don't need to have a fire truck come into the middle of the floor uh, during an event or after an event. And with that, it costs money, about $130,000, $30, and we didn't have those funds. Uh, so as staff, we reached out to Garco Construction and Clancy Welsh, and they were so graciously willing to provide these in-kind services to us to be able to fulfill those needs. So with that, uh, in uh, alignment with our, our naming and sponsorship policy, uh, we want to be able to celebrate GARCO and name the, the uh, elevated experience uh, after GARCO and be called the GARCO Terrace. So in your packet, you can see the uh, sandblasted impression. It's about a three-by-three three space on each side of that last pillar uh, that will be, uh, be able to view for all. And it was such a win-win. And this is just following up on an agreement that the Park Board uh, approved uh, a month back. And then we said we would come back to you with a follow-up on what that um, final uh, recognition would look like. And that's what you see today in your packet. Thank you, Garrett. I just want to remind everybody who's not talking to mute, that might help Nick. Nick, can we try you again? Can you speak and see if we can hear you? Rats. Well, it could be because- I'm, not, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Yay. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, thanks, Garrett. Appreciate that. Uh, technology problems, no fun. Um, all right. So I would like to make a motion to accept the U.S. Pavilion Elevated Experience name proposal uh, for Riverfront Park. And I would like to second that, being on the Riverfront Park Committee. Uh, I just think it's a fantastic thing that Garco has put forth for us. And uh, as everybody can see, the uh, photograph or the design 
I think it's just going to be a, a welcome uh, and a reminder as to how much GARCO has always been involved with the facility. I would echo that. I just want to thank GARCO for their generosity and for participating with us in this process and just being such a partner of the pavilion all these years. I think the sandblasting is very tasteful. Yes. Yep, that's exactly how I feel too. Very cool. All right, any other questions or comments? Okay, I'll call for the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Be opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. And thank you, Garco, for everything you've done for us. Um, we had a couple other action items, but those went through the consent agenda. Uh, so ultimately, Danielle uh, presented our update to the Riverfront Park redevelopment uh, budget. And as Mark kind of talked about earlier uh, in the meeting, we're pretty well done spending money almost. The big piece of pie is all one color except for one little sliver. So. Uh, very cool and, and super excited to see uh, what we will have left over and what we can do with those dollars, if if any. So keep our fingers crossed for that. Um, other than that, uh, our next scheduled meeting will be December 7th at 3 p.m. Thank you, Nick. And welcome back <laughs> in terms of audio. Yeah, thanks. Sorry about that. <laughs> No sorry worries. And sorry to land and uh, recreation for being sick. I really apologize. I was really looking forward to, to those meetings because we had, don't have them very often. So I apologize. We're glad you're back. All right, Bob Anderson, finance. Thank you. Um, the finance committee met through WebEx November 10th at 3 p.m. Mark Bunig presented the October financials and budget changes to the, early, to the earlier submitted 2020 budget. These changes were all generated from city accounting, impacting salary costs and interfund services. These changes resulted in a reduction in planned expenditures of $232,041. As, as we told Mark, feel free to uh, make changes like that anytime. We, we'd like to have our expenses reduced. The impact of operating revenue losses can offset by even Larger reductions in our operating expenses, primarily salary costs and supplies. In order to understand this relationship a little better, I developed a comparison of salary cost by department as a percentage of the total 1,400 salary cost, comparing years 2019 to years 2020. I'm not talented enough to uh, present my screen, so I'll just read it off the paper that I have. It's pretty, pretty, pretty small. Natural resources in 2019, they had their salary cost was 4.67 of, of the total parks fund. In 2020, that went to 6.4 percent. Recreation in 2019 had 20 percent of the total salary costs. This year, that went down to 11.9 percent. Park Ops was 29.8% in 2019 and 30.1% in 2020. Riverfront Park was 21.3% in 2019 and 215 in 2020. Admin, 24% in 2019, and this year that rose to 30.1%. The analysis indicates recreation was most impacted by salary reductions, while other departments with a smaller percentage of temporary workers, exemplified by the admin area, were less impacted. Recreation has proven to be most flexible, able to eliminate programs and the related salary costs, while still providing basic core programs for the community. There were no action items at finance, which actually led the meeting to be completed by 3.30. The next finance meeting will be December 8th at 3 p.m. through WebEx. And that's all. Thank you, Bob. All right, so under President's reports, I just have two items. One is the heads up that we will need to be forming a nominating committee uh, so that uh, officers for next year can be determined. So if you're interested in serving on that committee, let me know. 
The second is that several park board members have suggested we form a development and volunteer committee. An ad hoc committee is under the purview of the president to create, and this would be on the, uh, in the same vein as the joint arts committee. And uh, so it's development as in fundraising, not as in developing land, but as in fundraising and assisting many of our friends groups in what they do for parks, but also thinking of fundraising on an, a year-round basis uh, park-wide. Um, as a part of this, we would like to encourage citizens uh, so concerned and protective of Hamlin Park and others who might be interested in Riverfront Park to help us form friends committees in our various parks. It would be great to have friends groups all over town and to have a member from each of those groups on this committee. So we're just in the very early stages of talking about this. Stay tuned, and if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. So I will pass this now on to our liaisons, Conservation Futures, Greta Gilman. I'm muting myself. All right, thank you, uh, Jennifer. Uh, as we learned at last month's park board meeting, um, both grant applications submitted to RCO to help pay for land acquisitions at Beacon Hill are, are ranked number one in their respective categories. It's great news, um, and those ranked lists will get a uh, will officially get approved and forwarded to the state, but legislature for consideration. And conservation futures is cautiously optimistic that the grants will be uh, fully funded, which would be great because then that would uh, leave more uh, money for uh, acquiring other properties. A, a couple other highlights are some trailhead work uh, for trailheads to serve fish and hill conservation area and the Anton conservation uh, areas. And the next uh, open nomination round for uh, conservation features uh, program is uh, coming up in late. It's, they're hoping to have it in late 2021 or early 2022, and that is the update from conservation features. Thank you, mm -hmm. and Jerry for Park Foundation. Do you have any words as you sort of the outgoing person, and Barb Ritchie will be the incoming person. That's terrific. Um, yes. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, just the fact that uh, I had started being involved with the uh, Park Foundation before I became on the board, uh, moving back to Spokane, and, of course, having a huge interest, if you will, in the uh, carousel. And that was just beginning at that particular time. So that's when I met Terry and Yvonne and uh, just uh, had some really interesting and fun working relationships with them as a uh, patron here in the city. So with that, I would also like to uh, thank the board for uh, having me be the liaison for a short period of time. And just to... Uh, let everybody know that November 18th will be the next meeting of the Spokane Parks Foundation. Thank you. Barb, anything you'd like to say? Thank you. I look forward to the opportunity and Terry and I are meeting on Monday to do the warm handoff and I'll definitely learn from Jerry and others who served um, on the board and I look forward to um, meeting all of you and spending time and learning more. Thank you. Thank you, Barb, with your considerable experience. I know it'll be a benefit to everybody. So now we have our city council liaison, Lori Kinnear. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, my clock is going to go off. Sorry. I um, want to thank the, the board for approving our park um, ordinance changes. The next steps are will be on the council's advanced agenda, then a, a first reading, and then a final reading. So. We were thinking that Mary Miramatsu and I were thinking this is going to be done in a month. But with all the changes and all the input, you know, I, I always think things are going to be done quicker than they are. But uh, it's on its way, so thank you for that. We had the goats arrive at Hangman Park last week, and Garrett was there to uh, supervise, <laughs> make sure they got where they're supposed to be. I'm, I'm laid up with a knee injury, so I wasn't able to attend. 
and it was quite uh, a success. There were a lot of people that were just so appreciative um, just one more season that their house isn't going to burn down. So the goats were a huge success. There were about 200 of them that showed up, and next year they will be in District 1 and District 3, north and east, uh, northwest, northeast. And uh, Garrett, I don't know. If I, I thought I heard nothing but good things. We had one little grumpy man, but that was it. Um, they didn't, one man didn't like the fact that the goats were bleeding at night, you know, they make noise, but it, it was a, it was a good experience. Uh, and then finally our budget was almost ready to be finalized. We're still in the hearing phase, taking testimony from citizens. And I want to let people know that if you look at that final budget, you won't see uh, money dedicated to the aquatics program for next year, but what if COVID allows us to open, what we will do is then have an SBO that I will sponsor so that that aquatics program can go forward. We did want to put it in the budget um, as an expense and then have it just kind of sit there if it wasn't going to be used. But never fear, we will get that money um, if the aquatics program goes forward. So those are the highlights. Any questions? Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Council Member Kinnear. I know that Garrett took his kids down there, and so there were lots of kids of all kinds. All right. Mr. Jones, would you like to say a few words? I would. Thank you for that introduction. Yeah, the goats were fun. My boys enjoyed it, and I did too, just as much. Um, I wanted to just to highlight on a couple items that others didn't mention. Um, one is around our what we're calling our holiday ticket kind of activation of downtown Spokane and Riverfront Park. And we were act actually successful in receiving some CARES funding uh, to help with further safely activating Riverfront Park through the holiday months, uh, doing cross promotions with uh, downtown businesses and also working with Jennifer's team and Stephanie Curran at the PSD of opening up the convention center during these, these two winter months and allowing, uh, you know, SYSA, Skyhawks, our programs, pickleball, so we can have youth, adult, and uh, senior um, programs at, at the phase two guidelines that we'll be able to provide to during this, these winter months. Uh, what we're trying to achieve is how do we um, uh, how do we activate safely during these winter months to still get people outside doing uh, physical activities and staying positive when you can kind of have this lull, this depression during the winter months? And so we're successful. Can't thank the partners that we have with downtown Spokane Partnership, the Public Facilities District, and working with the City Council on this as well. Uh, we're pretty excited for the holiday season downtown. The other Greta mentioned about the Manitou Lights as well. We were successful uh, working with the Friends of uh, Manitou on receiving a nonprofit CARES funding for that as well. So stay tuned on how that evolves uh, for the, the holiday lights as we kind of evolve through the COVID time that we're going to have a, something, again, trying to find ways to say yes and not no uh, during the holiday season. Also, I just want to say congratulations to Doug Ferris as well for another five years at Indian Canyon. Uh, he's the example of uh, positive being, being together, working together. So we will love to work with him for another five years. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett. So that brings us to the end of our meeting. Does anybody else have anything for the good of the order? Uh, yes, Jennifer, I do. Uh, I would just like to offer a special thanks to our support staff, many of whom you heard today. I know uh, Jason virtually took over for me, which was greatly appreciated. Uh, but Nick Hammond and all the work he does, Jennifer Pappage, you know, I can go on and on. But I, I just want the public to understand that without that support staff, it's very difficult for any of us on the board to perform some of the duties, um, you know, share the information and really focus on the specifics that makes this whole 
environmental situation we are in right now really function. And so uh, my, my very special thanks from all of us on the board to all of you, because we uh, truly appreciate every single one of you. And I know, Mark Buning, you don't always get a lot of accolades <laughs> as you read through the budget, but uh, we really care and support your efforts as well. With that, thank you, Jennifer. Well, thank you. And gee, you stole some of my ending thunder. All right. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. I just, I just felt to... so bad being gone. I, you know, I have no idea on WebEx what I hit, but anyway, it disappeared for a while. So no thank worries. you. No, it's, it's whatever. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for all of your hard work. This really is a team effort, park board members and park and rec staff. Um, notice that the pavilion has won all of these national design awards, beating out all of the big, big cities in our country. And at a time when it's hard to find things to be positive about, being part of Park Board is that positive. It's been a tremendous experience for me personally, and I think a lot of people here feel good about what they're doing. Uh, so thank you to everybody for making that positivity go forward. I want to wish everyone a very happy, healthy, and safe Thanksgiving. And I look forward to seeing you all in December. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Take care.